a man would set up his business in a small town in Colorado. But when neighbouring companies and the town's council turned against him, he would get his revenge in the most imaginative way possible. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Have you heard of Killdozer? The engineer in me is screaming to cover this case, and so it had to be done. I don't recommend you trying this at home. So pull up a seat, grab a coffee, and sit back. This is the case of Killdozer. Vivid landscapes, mountains, forests, and canyons. These are a few of the geographical characteristics used to describe Colorado, one of America's mountain states. And our case today takes us 75 miles northwest of Colorado's capital, Denver, to Grand Lake. Grand Lake is a tiny town with a small population of only 506 residents in 2019, a crowd small enough to pack into an Airbus A380. Back in the 90s, that population was even smaller, 259, and one of those residents went by the name of Marvin John Hemeyer. Marvin was born on the 28th of October 1951 in South Dakota, and at the age of 38 he moved to the area of Grand Lake in 1991 for a six-month vacation. And after realising how much he loved the place, he decided he would settle in Grand Lake. A middle-aged man approaching his 40s, he was still as free as a bird, no partner, and no kids. Marvin was a fun-loving guy who liked to work hard and play hard. He highly valued friendship, and would bend over backwards to help anyone out in their time of need. He was confident, considered handsome, loved the outdoors, and had a knack in engineering. But along with a very ambitious and positive attitude, he was also someone that said things as they were, a man that some would say you should never cross. In the year of 1992, Marvin bought two acres of land next to West Meadow Road, located in Granby, not far from his home in Grand Lake. He purchased the land from the Resolution Trust Corp for $42,000, which back then was most of his money. And with the space, he planned to open up his very own business. After retiring from the United States Air Force in 1969, Marvin found his true calling as a skilled welder. With the US Air Force teaching him to take initiative in situations and control his own life, he didn't feel like working for someone else. And so in the year of 1992, he left his job as a mechanic and opened up his own muffler shop on the patch of land that he had just bought. For those first few years, things were going relatively well for Marvin. Not only had his business survived the early stages in life, but on top of that, he was becoming the best known welder in town. He even expanded his services out into cosmetic repair. But shortly before the year 2000, long shadows started to cast over Marvin's business. There were reports trickling in that the large patch of unused land next to the muffler shop was being eyed up by the Dotchev family, who wanted to create a concrete batch plant on the land. This was a problem for Marvin. Not only had he outbid Cody for the land several years prior, which started a feud between the two, but now the concrete plant would cut him off from his own business in multiple ways. For many years he had used the targeted land as a road to get to his muffler shop, and the proposed cement plant would entirely block that access. Eventually, the Dotcher family got in contact with Marvin. Conversations between the two parties started, were long, and even at times hair-splitting. But at one point, it seemed that everyone had come to an agreement. It was alleged that Cody and Marvin agreed that Marvin would sell his property for $250,000, almost six times what he'd paid for back in 1992. However, after agreement, Marvin immediately changed his mind, he upped his price from $250,000 to $375,000. Cody agreed. But after that agreement, Marvin once again upped his price to $1 million. Communication broke down and eventually fell silent. And then, in 2001, after more bureaucracy, both the Zoning Commission and the town's trustees approved the construction of the cement manufacturing plant, without Marvin's consent. Marvin was furious. He hadn't yet settled on an agreement with the Dotchefs, and now in a matter of weeks, he would have no access to his own business either. He appealed the town's decision, pumping as much as $150,000 into his efforts with an attorney. But despite this, he was unsuccessful. He even tried petitioning the problem to friends and residents of the town. But just like his appeal before, no dice. And Marvin's luck was only going to get worse. 
At first, he tried to play fair by petitioning the construction of a new road leading to his business around the concrete factory. He had even bought himself a bulldozer so he could do all of this work himself. This, however, was formally rejected by the Granby government. He now had no way to get to his property. To rub salt in the wounds, only days later, the Granby government fined Marvin over $2,500 for what they quoted as various violations. This included keeping junk cars on the property, which was part of his business, and also not being hooked up to the sewer line. And this was also despite the government previously cutting off his utilities to make way for the construction of the concrete plant. And as for the sewage line, now Marvin would have to ask Cody for permission to run a pipe underneath the concrete plant, something that Cody was sure to decline. Marvin was in despair. To put the situation bluntly, he had been shafted, not only by the new company, but by his local council too. Mentally, he was at the end of his rope, and his business, along with all the money he had invested into it, was about to go bust. One night on his balcony, through desperation, Marvin then created a cunning plan. One that would, however, have to remain top secret. He began leasing his workshop to a trash company, and several months later, ended up selling the property altogether for $400,000. During this time in 2003, the new owners gave Marvin several months to leave, and it was during those months that he began working on his top secret project. The bulldozer that Marvin had just bought about a year and a half ago to assist in the cooperation with his council and new neighbours was doing nothing but gathering dust. Not just that, but it just about fit into his garage too, by an inch in fact. Marvin saw this as a sign from God. Despite trying to get rid of both his building and his bulldozer, he had both. So what did that mean? To quote Marvin during his time of despair, I hope that the people of Granby learn that the way you punished me over the years that I was down there, and how you punished me, for the most part turned me into a desperate man. And desperate men do desperate things to recover a lot of times. Marvin's secret plans took about a year and a half to prepare. He spent all of 2003 through to mid-2004 modifying his Komatsu bulldozer into a fully armoured vehicle of power and destruction. He even set up a temporary home in his workshop to cover his basic needs. He would sleep in the day and worked in the night, not to disturb his concrete-loving neighbours. And while he worked, he secluded himself, ruminating on his unfortunate events and scheming of ways to get back at his enemies. He even recorded his hatred for them all. And on June the 4th, 2004, those plans would finally be realised. Marvin started his rampage by smashing through the wall of his very own business and driving his abomination bulldozer directly across his land into his rival's concrete plant. And there, as Cody and his workers watched in shock and awe, he destroyed two of their buildings before slowly trundling down the highway. By now, police were already hot on his tail, firing multiple shotgun and M4 rounds at the killdozer. But this was to no avail. He smashed into Mountain Park's electric, destroying its front facade. Maple Street builders were next, and when the building was compared next to his machine of destruction, it didn't stand a chance. Once he'd muscled his bulldozer through their front, Marvin redirected his machine. By now, 911 calls were flurrying in, and additional cops coming in to fight Killdozer wouldn't have to look hard for him either, because he was headed straight for their headquarters. And soon, SWAT teams were on his tail too. In a matter of minutes, both the town hall and the police station of Granby were obliterated. And despite the enormous damage inflicted to both buildings, just like all incidents before, no one was harmed or killed. Liberty Savings Bank was next on the list, and soon after Liberty Bank, Sky High News got it too. Residents in the area were evacuated, and in a state of full-on emergency, police and SWAT made every effort to disable the killdozer. But resistance was futile. In places, the bulldozer's armour was over one foot thick, and had concrete sandwiched between thick layers of tall steel. Attempts to disable Marvin's cameras with gunfire failed too. 
police bullets were unable to penetrate its 3-inch bulletproof plastic. Marvin had even lined a tank of compressed air to various outlets near the cameras to clear them from any dust and debris. Killdozer had also been equipped with three gun ports, including a Ruger Mini-14, an FNFNC, and a Barrett M82. All three were used against police, SWAT, and even Cody, but luckily, no one was hit. Killdozer then detoured down a dirt road, and attempted to cause serious destruction to the area by taking out a pile of propane tanks. He fired several rounds at the tanks, but luckily the skilled engineer Marvin Hemeyer made a design mistake. The port's design tolerances which allowed his gun to peek out from the steel armour was too small, meaning that when firing his gun at an angle, his rounds would actually fire into his own armour, stopping the bullets from hitting the propane tank and causing chaos. Defeated in his action, he drove back up the hill towards copycat printing. A man operating a scraper machine stepped up to the challenge in a 1v1. But as Killdozer rampaged towards him, he chickened out, eventually getting shunted out of the way by Marvin. It was during his annihilation of the copycat printing company that Killdozer's antifreeze lines blew, and his machine started to smoke. No worries, he thought. He continued to punch into the newspaper company that had allegedly reported against him and ridiculed him numerous times. Gambles was next, but by the time he had started digging into the building's side, a construction worker in a front loader had caught up with Marvin and blocked his only exit out. Killdozer's power slowly begins to fail at this point, and with his rear blocked, Marvin has no choice but to carry on forwards. And to his misfortune, the building he's currently destroying also has a basement. When the ceiling caved in, the floor to the basement did too, leaving one of Killdozer's tracks suspended in mid-air. The Killdozer is now entirely immobilised. With steering no longer possible for Marvin's Killdozer, it's the end of the road for him. For the last year and a half, Marvin had been trying to get his revenge, and now, as far as he could tell, he had got exactly just that. His livelihood was lost months ago, and now, with all this destruction around him, he'd have nothing but prison to look forward to in the future. And so on that note, Marvin pulled out his trusted pistol, put it into his mouth, and ended his own life. It would take police, along with the assistance of several specialist teams and a cutting torch, over seven hours to get into the interior of Killdozer. Over 400 bullets, several explosives, and several flashbangs had been used in an attempt to stop the machine. But none of them achieved any recognisable damage. And when they finally got inside of the bulldozer, there they found the body of Marvin Hemeyer. Once the Killdozer's roof was opened, along with Marvin, a video camera and three monitors were discovered. All were used to guide Marvin as a pilot through his rampage. They also found his weapons, a bottle of sparkling water, and a fan to keep him cool. Marvin knew that once he tipped the Killdozer's lid shut, he wasn't getting out of there alive, and so he made his final journey as cool and comfortable as possible. Despite the enormous amount of damage inflicted to a total of 13 buildings, miraculously, no one besides Marvin was actually harmed or killed. Inside the remains of his ruined muffler shop, police would soon find his audio tapes inside his makeshift home, those tapes describing the reasoning behind the killdozer and his actions. In one of his tapes, he shared, Because of your anger, because of your malice, because of your hate, you would not work with me. So now, I believe that I have to leave this world with a debt so great to you it can never be repaid. Anyway, hey, I hope you all have a great time, a good life. I've had a great life, and I'm going to put this tape and tape recorder in a plastic bag and somebody else can try to figure it out. We'll see you later. Although the town had mixed feelings after the day that Killdozer tore Granby apart, it did spur a new feeling of closeness in the community. Residents organised fundraisers to help rebuild the properties that he'd damaged, and with a final bill of over $7 million, they were going to need a few of those. 
Locals also suggested turning Marvin's bulldozer into a tourist attraction, to help pay for his damage. However, this was never seriously considered, and ultimately, his killdozer was completely destroyed. And shortly after, Marvin's ashes were spread up in the mountains of Colorado by his friends, all of them who loved to snowmobile with him in his former years. To this day, opinions are still split right down the middle on Marvin as a character. Was he a good man trying to prove a valid point, or was he deluded? Either way, whether you see Marvin as a villain with an evil machine, or as a man who stuck it to the greedy corporations and government of Grand Lake, he certainly held on to his word as a man that you should never cross. And if you find yourself in a similar situation in the future, whatever you think the solution may be, the correct answer is not a bulldozer. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this video interesting, or if you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe. I know this case is somewhat notorious, but what are your thoughts about Killdozer? Was he a villain or was he a hero? Please share your thoughts below. Thank you again for watching today folks, and as always I'll be right here behind this camera waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives though, look after each other. Goodbye.